but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father to you Take off your mask so they can know what they'll do. I was kidding. <laughs> Smile with your eyes. So Father, as your children, we just want to come into your presence, Lord. We want to experience all of your presence as we worship you for the amazing Father, for the amazing King that you are, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Amen. You 
So, Lord, receive all our praise and all our worship. Everything that we can muster, we give to you today. Because you deserve it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning. It's so good to see so many of you here this morning. Yay! Good morning. Right? Uh, it's also great that all these folk are joining us online from all over the world. It's good to to have them join us as well. And this morning we're going to continue with our series on John's Gospel. Amen? Amen. Uh, so if you've got your Bibles, turn to chapter 18. Uh, we're going to stick in chapter 18 with s some little ventures across into Matthew chapter 26 as well. So we're going to be dealing this morning with the subject, the arrest of Jesus which is found in the first 12 verses of John's Gospel. <clears throat> Something was happening in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was all a buzz. There were people from all over the empire present for the, fast over, uh, the Passover feast <laughs> and the celebrations that were there. The anticipation was high. And just last week, Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey. Many were asking, is he the one? Is he the Messiah who would free us from slavery? Now, you, let's use our imagination even more. And if there was a thing called TV news at the time, they would have had news channels going uh, that would have had experts on them for discussion, uh, you know, these experts offering their opinions, uh, saying things like, you know, we've got to answer the question that everybody is answer, asking. Is he the one whom the prophets spoke of? Just imagine for a while the, the excitement, the anticipation that there was in Jerusalem right at that time. And then, we interrupt this program with breaking news. Jesus arrested. The religious activist Jesus of Nazareth, a thorn in the religious leader's side, has been arrested in a garden just outside Jerusalem. An informant assisted the security forces with information concerning his whereabouts, and confirmed his identity. 
currently undergoing trial. We await the outcome. So to find out all about what happened, let's turn to our text in John chapter 18, reading from verse 1. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered into a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now, with blazing torches, lanterns and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized what was going to happen to him. And so he stepped forward to meet them and asked, Who are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more he asked them, Who are you looking for? And again they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you, I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink of the cup of suffering the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about this, this entire scene that was taking place, it, it boggles my mind. When I begin to think on why the one person who went around doing good and healing all says Acts chapter 10, 38, was considered a criminal to be hunted down and killed. What was it that he did that was so wrong? Was it healing the sick? Right? Maybe it was making the blind eyes see. Perhaps it was allowing a paralyzed man to walk again. But what we do know is that the Pharisees had been trying to get rid of Jesus from soon after he began his ministry. When Jesus healed the man with a deformed hand uh, on the Sabbath day, from then it started. And that, that you can read about in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, because when that happened, what he did was... Jesus challenged the Pharisees concerning their interpretation of the law. And so, because they feared what was going to happen, they feared unrest from the people, they began to plot and plan how to get Jesus out of the way, which we read about in Matthew chapter 12. Another example comes from later in his ministry, after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and many people believed in him and began to follow him in John chapter 12. Uh, sorry, John chapter 11, we read, the leading priests and Pharisees conspired together to arrest and kill Jesus. They wanted to do this stealthily. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, to take him before the chief priest and have him condemned to death in Matthew 26, verses 3 to 5. They were plotting how to capture Jesus and secretly kill him. 
Now the thing was, Jesus was aware of all their plans. He knew what was going to happen to him. And he made sure that his followers, his disciples, were informed about what was about to happen. He didn't run away. He didn't even hide away. Instead, he was determined. He was fixed on the goal. And that was to pay the price required to demonstrate God's love for each and every single one of us. So where did this happen? Well, just after the last, their last supper together, Jesus and the disciples left Jerusalem. They crossed over the stream in the Kidron Valley and went up into the grove of olive trees, which the other Gospels inform us is known as the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Right? And you can read about that in Matthew 26 and in Luke 22. Jesus went to this location knowing full well that Judas knew of this place. In this garden, Jesus prayed and asked the disciples to pray with him. But they fell asleep. Oh, maybe it was because they were tired. It was already late at night, you know, around 10, 11 o'clock, and they were all exhausted, so they fell asleep. But Jesus kept on praying. And later that same night, Judas arrived uh, with a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards, which we read in verse 3 of our text. And so Jesus went and he woke his disciples and he informed them that a huge crowd was coming. And then he went out of the garden to face them, to meet Judas, to meet with the priests and the security forces that had been sent to arrest him. Now when we read through the Gospels, all of the Gospels say that it was a multitude of people it was a huge crowd, or a large crowd. And there are some estimates that say it was as many as 600 people all together who had come out to arrest one man, Jesus. Imagine this, right? Uh, remember they went through the valley to get to the garden? Uh, and so that entire side of the, the valley was swarming with people all out to capture one man. Those religious leaders, they wanted to make sure, absolutely sure, that Jesus would not slip away again. Because that had happened many times in the past. And so the crowd came, and they were armed with weapons. Well, not rubber bullets, but weapons. <laughs> and they carried lanterns, and they carried torches. They were intent on ensuring they would find Jesus, no matter what happened, no matter where he hid, even if he ran away, they were intent on capturing him. Mm. Yeah. And of course, their weapons would also help to make sure that all Jesus' followers would not rise up in unrest. The time that this took place and the location where it took place was ideal for secrecy. <laughs> it was hidden from the general public. They did not arrest Jesus whilst he was ministering in the temple. They didn't even arrest him while he was walking through Jerusalem in the middle of the day. They waited until it was dark. They needed the cover of darkness so that everything could be done secretly. Now, I don't know about you, but my God is a God of light. <laughs> yeah. Right? Draw your own conclusions. Their thinking uh, was that this was there, as in the Pharisees, their thinking was that this was the only way to stop any rioting or unrest from taking place as the, the followers of Jesus tried to protect him. And then we come to the arrest. In verse 12 it says, they arrested Jesus and tied him up. But you know, there, 
there are at least four different things that happened just before that arrest took place that are really quite fascinating. So let's look at them. The very first thing that took place uh, was that Jesus was very willing to go out. We know from the scripture that he, John clearly shows us Jesus was not a victim. He was not taken by surprise when they came for him. He knew this was his time. And he remained in charge as he willingly walked out to the garden, empty-handed, but not defenseless. He knew that he could ask his father for thousands of angels to protect him and the disciples. But he walked out alone. And just that action of him walking out alone uh, startled the soldiers. Because they had arrived with a mindset. They had arrived with a preconceived idea that they were, gonna ex they were expecting a fight. Mm. Otherwise, why would they bring weapons? Yeah. They, they were expecting that Jesus would run away. Mm. Otherwise, why would they bring so many people? They were expecting him to go and hide. Right? Otherwise, why would they bring torches and lanterns to hide, light up all the hiding places? They must have been so surprised when he walked out on his own empty-handed. Do you know, Jesus was also willing, uh, and, and he reminded us, Reminded us of this in John chapter 10, uh, in verses 11 to 18, where he taught on the Good Shepherd and how, how the Good Shepherd willingly lays down his life for the sheep. And this passage ends with Jesus saying this the Father, the Father loves me because I am willing to give up my life in order that I may receive it back again. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. Mm -hmm. I have the right to give it up. I have the right to take it back. This is what my Father has commanded me to do. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus was willing not only to be arrested and have to face trial as an innocent, but to ultimately give his life for us. The second thing that happened, we find in John chapter 18, verses 4 to 6, where Jesus faces the huge crowd, and he says to them, who are you looking for? And they say to him, Jesus of Nazareth. Now many of the Bibles have the words, I am he, here, as Jesus' reply, because that's good English. But you know, the Greek puts it, that the correct text is, Jesus answered, I am. Yeah. Now, my imagination kicks in whenever I, I read this verse. And my imagination reminds me that uh, Hollywood, whenever they want to portray a very powerful verse, or a very powerful voice, right? they do this. They have a deep, deep bass voice with lots of echo on it. Have you ever heard this? Right? So you can imagine this. It's, I am echoing down the valley. Wow. Right? Just, just use imagination a little bit. It, it must have been so right, awesome. But the one thing that we know, that by declaring the covenant name of God, Jesus left no doubt as to who he is. Yeah. He is God. The same God who spoke to Moses in the desert in Exodus 3.14, where he says, where God says, I am who I am. You must tell them that is the Israelites, I, the one who is called I am has sent me to you. Now it is unlikely that all the people who were standing around in the crowd understood Jesus to mean, okay, 
It's me you're looking for, here I am. <laughs> when he said, I am, the Israelites knew the covenant name of God. Yeah. They knew it. They knew that when Jesus said, I am, exactly who he was saying he was. Yeah. They'd arrived expecting a criminal. They'd arrived uh, to find an outlaw to arrest. They, they'd come along to, to take a troublemaker into captivity. But instead, they were trying to arrest I am. Can you just think of this? Created human beings trying to arrest their creator. Man trying to arrest God. It just defies logic for me. It doesn't make any sense. And so it's no wonder that the crowd stumbled back uh, and fell face down before that divine power that Shekinah glory that was there when Jesus uttered these words and says his name. Now some of us know, and some of us from experience, uh, that we, as people, we cannot stand in God's presence. Yep. Right. And, and I really believe that this is what happened to those seasoned soldiers, to all those, uh, the, the Pharisees and, and the temple police, everybody who was there. They were overcome by God's presence. Faced with God in all His glory, they could not stand. And it was only later, once they'd recovered and stood up, right, that when Jesus said to them, who are you looking for? And again He replied, it's me. But they arrested Him. Just before the arrest, something else happened. Peter's unrestrained passion for Jesus uh, comes to the fore. And what happens is he jumps out, swinging his sword wildly, rushing at those arresting Jesus. All he manages to do is cut off the ear of a high priest's servant. Jesus, uh, Peter knew that by attacking such overwhelming odds, he could not survive. Never. But without any further thought, he runs straight into a violent confrontation, relying on his physical strength and his lack of ability with a sword to try and bring about a change in these circumstances. Right? God had a plan. Yeah? But Peter feeling strong in himself, was trying to fix God's plan. So that God would have to make a fix to fix the fix that Peter fixed. And yet Jesus says to uh, Peter, put your sword away. Violence only creates more violence. By relying on his own strength, what Peter was doing was he was denying God's ability to come to Jesus' defense. If that was part of God's plan. And Jesus had spoken often to the disciples about what the future held. Uh, Not only for him, but for all of them as well. He had spoken about the suffering that he was about to experience. And perhaps at that time Peter didn't believe it. Or maybe he didn't want to believe it. We don't know. Maybe he just didn't trust God enough. And so Peter reacted. We know that earlier in that evening, Jesus prayed while Peter slept. Jesus was trusting God uh, to see him through all the suffering that was to come. Peter was relying on his own strength and abilities to bring about a solution to what was happening. And I believe we can learn from this. Learn that when we do not pray, and we constantly search for what God wants us, and constantly search for what God wants us to do, we end up reacting and doing life in our own strength, causing hurt to the people around us. And the last thing that happened 
around the arrest was in Luke 22. We read that Jesus touched the man's ear and healed him. Even, even whilst being arrested, Jesus took the time to heal the servant's ear that Peter had cut off. Jesus says priority is always to show us, his people, that he cares for us and sees our needs as his priority. The crowd that, we, uh, that were there to arrest Jesus saw him heal the high priest's servant. And yet, they still arrested him. See, what happens is once we have a, an opinion in our mind, we've, once we've created a perception in our mind, be it of some person or of some circumstances or of an issue, Nothing changes that opinion or perception until we ourselves face the possibility that our opinion could be wrong. And if we don't, even faced with physical proof of good deeds, our preconceived view causes us only to see the negative aspects of that action. So as we read through all the Gospels, we know that Jesus knew what he would be facing. That he chose to surrender his own will to that of his Father. That he went to the garden knowing that Judas knew of the place. We know that Jesus walked out voluntarily to the huge crowd and demonstrated the power of God. And he still chose to allow them to arrest him. His goal was to fulfill the ministry and the mission that the Father had set before him, freeing all mankind from the slavery of sin. We've also seen that Peter reacted, using his own strength and ability to try and make God's plan happen when he wanted it to. Yeah. And our lesson from this is as we walk, live through the daily, our daily life in the middle of this pandemic, we can respond to the situation similar to Peter did, determined to do it out of our own strength. Or we can follow Jesus' example, go to the Father and tell him, Lord, I surrender. So that we know how to face today's challenges. So how do we live out each day? Like Peter? Or like our Lord showed us? Amen. After this final song, the pastors are going to be in the front here, available to pray with you. Uh, and if you feel that uh, over this pandemic time, you've been behaving a bit like Peter, and you want to pray with someone, we are here to pray with you. Right? We want to pray for uh, those who feel that there's just too much going on, and they, they feel unable to cope with, with what's happening. <clears throat> We're here to pray with you. We're here to pray with those who are not feeling well, right? because we know that our God heals. So straight after this song, will not you come and join us? We've, we've got the lines spaced out to keep physical distancing. And those of you who are watching online, please contact us via Facebook uh, or telephonically. And we'll be able to pray with you. Amen. So bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name.
the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the